Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our next week in our encounter study. I am Reverend Rebecca Zardi, and I am the Director of Ministry with Women for the Ministry Council for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And You're a pro Chris at that now. Trying to lose your microphone. Did you just I try am. to throw it off of there? Good gracious. So, my name is Chris so, Fleming. So, who are you? <laughs> yeah, my name is Chris Fleming. I'm the Adult Ministries Coordinator for the Ministry Council of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and... Um, I am the editor of this here Christian curriculum, and I'm glad that you're using it. I uh, like it a lot. I had an experience in a Sunday school class that was not using the encounter uh, Sundays ago, and we've got a good curriculum here, and I'm thankful that y'all are using it, and um, you should have by now uh, your encounters for the summer. That's going to be written by Dr. That is written by Dr. Estes, and it's a study in Job and Ecclesiastes. I wanted to do some wisdom literature. Um, this this time um because yeah you don't always get to it so no that's true we don't really get to it and and before you go anywhere this morning um go ahead and click that little button down below and like and subscribe to our channel make sure you click the little bell so that you're notified of new content that's coming up and the more subscribers we have to this channel the more it gets out there the more information we can get out yes chris is raising his hand Sorry. what do you want <laughs> That was awesome. Yeah. We're learning how to use all these fun tools on Zoom. We've been we've been messing around with some of them. So, so exciting today that Chris is our, our writer for this is lesson 13 for Sunday, May 29th. We are in Philippians chapter two. Let's go ahead and start with our prayer for illumination today. Holy God, the word teaches us to take. It teaches us that the biggest, the smartest, and the proud will be considered valuable and important. In your word, we read that it is the servant. It is those who give up these things that will be first in the kingdom of God. Soften our hard hearts that we might receive this hard teaching with gladness. Strengthen our hands and feet that we might live out this truth we learned today. Amen. I got a little, a little long-winded on that one, didn't I? No, yeah, okay. but it's beautiful because it's true. I mean, it's really what we're going to dive into today. Um, our, our memory verse comes from Philippians chapter two, verse three. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. It's so it is a tough one. And this is a really, this is a really tough topic, especially in, I think in the Western culture, and we're going to get into this, but I really think in the Western culture, this is really difficult topic for us in particular, not our brothers and sisters, all worldwide in some of the cultures more in the Western, because we're taught to be rugged individuals. We're taught to be self-reliant and self-sufficient. These are all, these are all our buzzwords that are going yeah. on today. Bootstraps. But you started, yeah, exactly. You know, that we're supposed to be able to just take care of ourselves and not depend upon anybody else. And that what we says is amazing, is amazing, but you start with the introduction with how do you define humility? And do you consider yourself humble? So what, and I love the song that you picked. That was funny. I wrote <laughs> it's a beautiful that song. No. Uh, <laughs> sure. So what is it that you want us to really like start with as we're, as we're diving into this lesson today? So we, we've been in the book of John for most of the year. Mm -hmm. And in John, there's the scene where Christ is about ready to wash his disciples feet. And it says, knowing that he came from God and was going back to God, he loved his disciples to the very end. So humility isn't, this is the other, the, so the one side of Western culture is this pompous, prideful nature, right? Like, sure. we go big, you know, in, in America. Go big or go home. Right. And we have, yeah. we have a drive where, where more stuff is a, is a reflection of our greatness. Yeah, absolutely. Status. Also, yeah, at the same time, we have a crisis of um, depression and uh, our self-esteem yes. at the same time is terrible. And neither of those obviously are humility. And so humi we'll talk about it a little bit later with the C.S. Lewis quote. The, the way Jesus was humble is that he knew that he was God's child. Yeah. And he was secure in that, in his identity. And so it was no skin off his nose then to be humble. 
to wash the feet of the disciples, where someone might have thought that was humiliation, he didn't have to prove anything to anybody. He knew his position. And so I think that's what I try to say with humility. On the one hand, I'm a child of God. So what task could God call me to or what experience can I go through that could humiliate me? I'm loved by God. Mm. That's my base. Um, Ooh, that's deep. That's deep. So that's, and so, and so that theology then continues with this Philippian passage where Paul says, although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality, equality with God as something to be exploited, but he humbled himself. And so when you know who you truly are, and that your worth is not based on your actions or what other people think about you, but on the position you are as God's child, you can then become a slave or a doulos to God. Right. So that's where I'm at there. Okay. Okay. So how would you personally, layman's terms, make it easy for people? Oh, how that's do you hard for me. Humility. Yeah, I know it is. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> right. I'm stretching you outside of your box. So I, thinking correctly of yourself. Okay. I mean, yeah. You know, not too high, not too low. Yeah. Who you are. That's that's an excellent definition of humility. Of course. Do you consider it is. do you consider yourself humble? <laughs> now that no. you answered yes it that and way. no. <laughs> yeah, I joke about it a lot, but like when I have performance reviews uh, at various jobs, I know when I've done a good job and I know when I haven't. And and I can confess when I haven't. When I've done wrong, I can confess I've done wrong, right? Sure. I have moments of inhumility. So like, like I know I'm not, again, William Shakespeare. So if I write a lesson, I know it's not like a classic. It's not John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. I know that. Sure. But when I think somebody's just trying to be mean and they haven't given it a good looking, I get pompous about it. And then five minutes later, I'm like, you know, you do your best. Go on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have moments for sure. Yeah. Sure. I do think highly of myself. Well, (laughs) you, you, you know, sometimes, okay. And and there's a balance. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit, but there's a balance because there's a point of recognizing and understanding your own skills and abilities. And when you have done a good job. But there's also a line where you can recognize that you've done a good job, but then you push it too far. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I mean, there's a line, there's a line. I don't, I don't know how to define that line in particular, but you know, when you've just, when you've pushed it too far, when you went, you know, tooted your own own horn way too much. And, and why is it so hard for us to be humble? Garden of Eden. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, like the Garden of Eden, that was. Um, Adam and Eve wanting to be like God, but not submissive to God. That's right. our human nature. We want yes. to control things and worship ourselves. Yes, we do. We, we love to love to be in control and get the accolades and praise. I mean, when you look at young children, who doesn't want to have all the accolades and praise and have their name in lights, right? I mean, that's what kids live for. That's what, that's what I think we as people live for. We want to be recognized for what we've done. Yep. And sometimes for what we haven't done that we just take credit for, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Let's jump into the exploring the scripture. You really start off with the term doulos and we've talked about it last week, but for those that weren't with us last week and those that haven't been with us before, Dulos, what does this mean? So again, dulos in some tra- Bible translations is uh, translated as servant, um, which is okay. But I mean, it really means slave in all of its horribleness. It means slave. It means, uh, you know, you're not your own. You belong to someone else. And so mm-hmm. the setting for this, again, is Paul is in house arrest, right? He's, you know, it's it. I've got in here, it's the imagery of persecution, slavery, and imprisonment imprisonment gives this portion of the letter the proper context and so um paul will bring verse seven of our passage 
when he's speaking about Christ says, but Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And so Paul is, as he is writing his little theological treatise here, he is practicing what he's preaching because he's in change for the gospel, right? So, sure. so that's that. So what Paul then does is um, what's called the imperative indicative uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, some, some people call it different various things, but the imperative and indicative balance is, is what I was taught when I was growing up. But basically the, the uh, indicative is here's the truth that, or here's something Christ did. And because Christ did it, you are doing this, right? Like, um, and I, and I want to say it's not moralism. So if we're not careful as preachers, we can say, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not. And if you do these things, you're a Christian. No, that's not true. That's just you being a pretty good person. Um, the Holy Spirit in you, because Christ has accomplished these things, is creating a new person by which you won't steal, by which you won't commit adultery or these kinds of things. Yes. Um, uh, and so anyway, that, that's kind of briefly what, what that is there. Um, right. So by becoming a slave to Christ, and, and that, that is a hard term for us. I think we talked about this a little bit last week. That is a really hard term for us to understand in our context, just because it is, it, it can be, and has been through, through the centuries, a very terrible thing to be a slave and slave to somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, but when we become a slave to Christ and the Holy spirit works through us, there are things that changes in us that we recognize that we shouldn't do not because it's a moral superiority, but because it's the, it's the right thing. And, right. and as we grow and change and mature, God keeps opening our eyes to other things in our life that we need to let go of or change or look at differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, That's yeah. To sum it up in verses 12 and 13, Paul, Paul talks about all these things Christ did. And so mm -hmm. in 12 and 13, Paul says, therefore, right, because of the yes. truth of the gospel, because you're a Christian, as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds, mm -hmm. you know, Christ has done this. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling because or for it is God who is doing the work in you, enabling right. you both to will and to work his good pleasure. Yes. Right. But let's so. talk about fear and trembling a little bit, because right. I think too many times preachers use those words, fear and trembling, and we don't define them. We don't give the information needed to understand that terminology, because when we think of fear, we think of being afraid, like, you know, I don't like spiders. So I'm like, wow, ah, you know, spider, that's, that's fear. But this isn't the kind of fear that we're talking about here. And that's not what Paul's talking about. He's, he's working out our salvation with fear and trembling, but it's not being afraid of it. It is that reverential. So let's talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, I think even, in, yes, I think you've got it right. Like this is the same as you would fear your parents. You love your parents. You fear your parents. Sure. You know, cause you know, depending on when you grew up in life, you could get a spanking and you didn't want one. Right. right. So yeah, they always yeah. had the, they had the hammer ready to go um, <laughs> or ping pong paddle yeah, or whatever it is. Right. <laughs> like it's just, but they had the authority or they had the power by which to mm -hmm. say, this is how it's going to be. And yeah. so fear. Now, I don't think you can get out. Um, some people may disagree with me. There's an element of actual fear in reverence. And sure. I don't, yes, I, I don't think it's scriptural just to just to say, hey, you approach God simply as your loving father, unless you're right in your no. relationship toward the loving father, because this is somebody who can spank you, you know, or with a yes. bolt of lightning, take you out. You know. Yeah, true. I mean, that's true. I just had a great image right there. But yeah, that's true. Here's an image that I think, some, I mean, it's like um, you're surrounded in a cave with a whole bunch of dynamite. You know, if you wanted to smoke, you're going to be real careful lighting that cigarette, right? Like there's an element of fear and respect and maybe you conduct yourself differently and you don't smoke in a 
room full of dynamite, well, right? Yeah. You, you take okay. precaution. Um, and I think that's what that is. The fear and trembling, I don't think we take them separate. I think Paul's using right, somewhat yeah. like a colloquialism. Yeah, I think it goes together. Yeah, and it's just fear and trembling. It's like, take this serious. Like, God's not to be played with. Like, Christ mm -hmm. died for you. That's serious. It's not mm -hmm. fluffy. But it's an act full of love and devotion. Yes. So. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful way of putting it. That is a beautiful way of putting it. So you have a just discussion question. We're saved by grace. What does it mean to work out our salvation? Yeah. So this is one I've thought about. That's before. that's sticky because we we tend to get too stuck on the works. Which you I know, mean, and, ultimately, that's you know, what is the fruit you bear, right? So yes, like that that is your works. But we tend to, I think there's a lot of people that really get stuck on. If I just do enough, then I can earn my salvation. Yeah, and that's, that's not that's the Pharisees that's way. Not, that's that's right. the way of every religion that's not Christ centered. Yes. Yes. Um, because we are saved by grace and it is a free gift. It is a gift that we accept. And we do works, but that's not how we earn that. So here's the way I've been taught or I've studied a lot of my stuff I've studied I have I don't know 15 years ago I really got bitten by the spiritual disciplines bug um because it number one by willpower alone I've never been able to like not eat the cookie when I'm on a diet I've never been able to make myself run right I've never sure. been able to be like oh I'm gonna give my 10 percent to the church and do it all the time like my willpower sucks um and I'm going to guess so does everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And so like going to the church of Christ school, there is an element where there's a push of, of obedience based Christianity. Yes. And so I struggled with that because I never was good enough. We talked about that last week. I stumbled upon some of the mystics. I stumbled upon some of the, you know, old church rituals. So here's how I understand how you work out your salvation for fear and trembling for it's God who's at work within you. The goal of the Christian life is to fall in love with Christ. And the deeper you're in love with Christ and the more the Holy Spirit works, the more your nature reflects Christ. So the work that we do is to love Christ, just as I always go back to marriage. Yes, because, I mean, it's a great example. Yeah, I mean, like, I could check off every box of making sure I could make sure food was prepared anytime my wife woke up. I could stand at the door waiting for her to get on break and, and go rush at her every need. Uh, but if I didn't love her, all I'm doing is just works. And, the, and, and eventually I won't care if I don't love her. And so mm -hmm. you mm. develop that love. You know, you do, you do practices that develop affection you know, even physical touch, date nights, mm -hmm. these kinds of things develop that head, heart, and hands into the, you know, the, the love that, that it should be. Yeah, absolutely. And, so. it, and it takes, okay, so going back to marriage and thinking about working out our salvation. A marriage, once the vows are said, is not perfect. It is not sunshine and roses your entire life. No. It takes work. It takes time. It takes commitment. It takes dedication to each other, learning each other, growing together, maturing together, sharing in life struggles together. And, and it's the same concept. It's you can accept Jesus and be saved. Absolutely. But falling deeper in love and understanding that love that Christ has for us takes that time and commitment and dedication. Yeah. And, and the more you work on it, the stronger that bond becomes. Yeah, I think it was a couple, it was a couple quarters ago, I wrote one of these lessons and I used the example. I remember a, a marriage counseling session that I had to where this guy was working 60 hours a week, like, because he wanted he he wanted to provide a lot of stuff for his family, his financial sure. security, and there was a little pride in it too, right? Like, sure. but ultimately he told himself, "I'm gonna 
basically disconnect myself from my wife and family so that I can work enough to provide what they want. And then I remember the woman saying, look, I don't want that. I want you. Right. And so that's where we get the difference between uh, working for our salvation Mm -hmm. and then falling in love with Christ. Like God doesn't need your service that bad. He does want you. Right. Like, so. Yeah. That's awesome. That's where I see that. Okay. So that's working out our salvation with that fear and trembling. Yeah. The last part of that, uh, though, is it a combination of you and God? I I shudder to say a combination of your work and God's work, but I mean, there's an intention. Like, if you're not intentional, it's like a marriage. Your marriage is going to go bad if you're not intentional. Sure. It's not work to be intentional necessarily, but it's intention. But Yeah, that dedication, that commitment, you know, I mean. You have to, you have to be committed to this. This is, you know, I mean, it's just like, if you weren't committed to your marriage, what kind of marriage would you have? Right. It wouldn't be one for long. It it would have have one for very long. Somebody would be walking out the door (laughs) if you had no commitment. How about digging deeper? Well, you've got, you've got a really good comparison here that we need to talk about. So Paul, Paul really sets us up to understand who Adam is as a, as a Christ figure and then how Christ came for that redemption. So, yeah, this is somewhat purposeful by Paul, I think. So in Philippians chapter two, verses five and six, he says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself. So there's the image that Christ was God, right? So like in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God word became flesh dwelt among us so jesus christ so in the garden of eden the temptation was to become like god but not not be obedient or be submissive to god because god Mm -hmm. says don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then satan says yeah but if you do you'll be like god so they shortcut the process and Mm. and so then in romans 5 Paul says Adam is a type of Christ. So he says, uh, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin. And so death spread to all because all have sinned, right? So the act of Adam, we're going to get in some theology, and this is where Kermelin Presbyterians and Presbyterians will differ a little bit. Um, But because of Adam's sin, death spread to the world. Everybody Mm -hmm. died. In the old Puritan books, it's Adam's fall, sin we all, right? Mm -hmm. Or total depravity or whatever, original guilt, whatever you want to call it. Yep, yep. So then in this Philippians 2 passage, Paul says, but Christ was submissive to God. He was obedient to God. So therefore, he didn't consider equality with God as something to be exploited. So Adam exploited the, the becoming like God. But Jesus Christ submitted and emptied himself and became humble in order to follow the will of God. Mm-hmm. So then Romans says in uh, Romans 5, 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through one man's trespass, much more surely has the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. All right. And so um, then uh, Paul says Adam was a type of Christ, um, and and what a type is is again probably a year ago in one of our encounters, uh, I explored the fact that Joseph was a type of Christ, and mm-hmm. what a type is is that it's a story or a way of thinking. It's like a framework mm-hmm. that you're supposed to think about the future things. So Joseph was a type of Christ. He was left for dead in a pit. He became the ruler. Mm -hmm. That's how we were supposed to think about the Messiah when when he came. Mm -hmm. So for Adam, it was his act of disobedience that caused sin and death. The act of obedience of Jesus Christ creates life and righteousness. Yes. Yes. Problem is, that can lead and has led. There's like Unitarian Universalist or whatever. There's different denominations that believe then in a um, universal salvation. Um, sure. You know, 
but I'll let you dig into or ask questions that you would want to ask there because mm -hmm. you know so it's it's the it's the reversal of we had we had Adam in the garden who had this beautiful relationship and then was offered the opportunity to shortcut the program mm -hmm. and elevate themselves to right. a position of power and authority. And then you have the reversal where you have someone who's in a position of power and authority who emptied themselves, humbly came and submitted to the plan like was supposed to be in the beginning. And because of the plan, now we have righteousness in life. Yes. Which is, which is a beautiful story. Yeah, but yeah, so, okay. So, so there, and I agree there, there is the problem of then we have different denominations who are saying, well, then that free gift of grace that was given for everyone, that means we're all saved, right? Yeah, that's sure. So this is where what we, what, there's a struggle, like what we would call the imputed righteousness of Christ. Okay. All right. So my Bible friends, hang in there. But it's an important thing. Yeah. Just as humanity is guilty because of the act of Adam, it helps us in our security that we're declared righteous in Christ. It's not on the basis of what we did. It's on the basis of what Christ did that makes us righteous. Mm -hmm. So like when we stand before the court, this is the probably the classical historical argument. The judge will say not guilty, even though you are because you're not being judged. It was the act of Christ or the faithfulness of Christ that was being judged. Mm -hmm. So Christ is your mediator. Um, he is your sacrifice. He is your head, if you will. He's your representative. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, again, there's different theologies, and, and I'll get roasted by some preachers because of this type of theology, but it is the one that I feel the most comfortable with understanding Adam as a type of Christ mm -hmm. in the work of Christ. Like, as we were saying, our salvation is not dependent upon our, our righteousness, right? but because Christ's righteousness yes. is imputed to us. There's a word to look up. Yeah. Okay. Very so, good. So it's this, this, uh, this submission that Christ did and his humility that we're assured of, of where our right. exaltation with Christ. Right. Yeah. We're saved okay. by the life of Christ, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. It's yes. not as though Christ was just this piece of meat that died on the cross, and therefore this vicious God is satisfied. It was the no. life of Christ that demonstrated righteousness and submission and holiness. Christ. And because he did that, the death of Christ was valuable, or it was the atonement, mm -hmm. able to be. It was a lamb without blemish. And then in the resurrection, God declares victory mm -hmm. for Christ and mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Amen and hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you end this section with some, some really good discussion questions, Yeah. Uh, you know, man, and, and Sunday school teachers, whoo, this one may take a little time right here because there's, where do you draw that line between humility and humiliation? Because there is a line. There is a line. There is a line, but is it, is it going to be a cultural line? Um, is it a personal line? And I think all of the above is the answer. But what, what do you think on that one? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how this is a good way to get Twitter jailed or canceled because <laughs> at, what, at what line did it yeah. cross Christ showing humility to Don across to being beat, stripped, crown of thorns? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so if that's the example, what's the line? Right. That's true. But I am simply not going to say that like a wife should stay with right. a husband that abuses her. I'm not going to say that. Right. I'm not going to say a kid no. needs to stay in a home where mom and dad don't care and they're starving to death. That's not right. yeah. good. And I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, 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 there is. But what is the line? I mean, if like, if, if being stripped, beaten, crown of thorns, spit on, thrown on a cross is humility, 
as as we were defining it where's the line between humility and humiliation and the only Mm -hmm. way that i can it's like slavery Mm -hmm. it's that it's a voluntary choice that you've prayed about it and then and i've been here like again i've I've said you probably have two in this like i've opened we've opened our home to kids but there comes a time to where if the kid's not yeah doing what they need to do there's no reason I'm getting taken advantage of in my family. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's something that everybody needs to pray about and seek, seek guidance and wisdom on as to where, where it is that they, what is and what isn't the right thing. Yeah. And, and, and be careful of manipulation. When you're trying to help somebody, you can get manipulated and you can easy. So I think it's a good prayer life, like a connected life with God, because I don't think God leads you into complete humiliation all the time. No, I don't know. And I do. I I agree. I think in the times of my life, when I feel like I'm supposed to help somebody, but I'm concerned because of the situation or circumstance, it is through prayer that I understand where my line is. Like, I know that I'm supposed to do X, Y, Z, but at the end of that, then I go no further. Like this is where, this is where God made it very clear to me that this is, you know, if they keep pushing beyond this point, then, then it's time for me to say, I'm sorry, I can't help you anymore. Yeah. And that's hard. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because you don't know, you, you, you question yourself to say, is it just, I'm tired of it? Or am I, it's like, yeah, you you know, you ask somebody to do something. Let me pray about that. you know you know so we'll see that that is a really hard thing so but but seek god and those things so then we jump into learning from the scripture and you really bring us back to this whole idea that the church for the last two thousand years has these beautiful hymns these beautiful creeds doxology that all points us to the same direction and this is why we do, this is why we sing those. This is why we continue to say those creeds because it does bring us back to this point of understanding who Christ is and how Christ interacts in our life and, and how we are supposed to work together as a family for this. You have yeah. those virtues that we see in scripture, servanthood, yeah. sacrifice, submission. Right. The reason I bring that up too is because like, if this is one of the first creeds, like you probably, you're, some of y'all's churches probably do the Apostles' Creed and you don't really understand why you do it maybe every week. But basically what the church is saying is these are the most important doctrines and you're going to say it every week because we want you to know this. It's that important. Mm-hmm. And so if one of the earliest church creeds was about Christ humbling himself and going to the cross, then that means the church from the very beginning thought this is super important, right? Yes. And and so the way I illustrate this, your church probably has a favorite hymn that you don't really notice, but you sing it about every two months because everybody loves it. So right. like if you go to a church and you know, like there's a church that I attend often that sings I'll Fly Away a lot, right? And then there's another, church, like when I was the pastor, we sing All Creatures of Our God and King a lot, <laughs> right? But so they help create what's important for the body, right? And yeah. so what my point there was is from the very beginning of the church, service, sacrifice, submission was super important. And, mm-hmm. and so much so that we don't need to let it go at all in the way we sure. do ministry or whatever else. Absolutely. And then you say that the, the scripture selection today focuses on, on humility, which it does. We've talked about this quite a bit, that humility is as necessary now as it was in the first century. In this passage, we learned that humility is the key to living a God honoring life. And that leads us into C.S. Lewis. Oh my goodness. This, this beautiful quote from C.S. Lewis, if you're following along, it's on top of page 88. Yeah. He writes, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it is thinking of yourself less. We are children of God, loved by God, secured in Christ. This truth enables us to think less of ourselves and more about others. Yeah. And that's, that's the key to humility. Is it not? Yeah. It's not, it's not forgetting. It's not ever, you know, the, again, it goes to that line. There's a line. But it's not ever recognizing the fact that you have a great ability. 
that you're that you have a great singing voice or you're a great teacher or you prepare amazing sermons or you know whatever it is that you're a great mom that you're a great dad that you're a, whatever you are it's not never recognizing the skills and abilities and gifts that you have been given but it's understanding that you think about yourself less, less. and about other people and the other people around you more. Yeah. So like, if you think about it, somebody who is, who all, who is maybe not real good on their Mm self-esteem, they're constantly thinking about themselves because they're constantly thinking, am I good enough? Did they like me? Did I mess up? Did I do this? Did I do that? And you're always questioning yourself. And just Mm -hmm. because you think you're not good enough doesn't mean you're being any less egotistical it just means you have a bad self ego, right? And so right, the healthy right. would be serve. Like, right, I'm good. Let's go. Um, mm-hmm. So that's what, that's really what CS was trying to say. Like, just putting yourself down, it's still focusing on you. Forget that. Yeah. Go and do your work. Like, right? Yeah. Like, you are who you are. Let's go. Yes. Yeah. And man, that is so hard when we live in a culture and time where, man, talk about all the social media influencers, you know, who think about themselves constantly and continuously, you know, I mean, that's just, gosh, why do we have to record? You know, that's something I think I'm just going to harp on my little soapbox for a minute. That's something that drives me crazy. How come we have to record our good deeds all the time and post them all over uh, social media about the great things that we're accomplishing? Why can't you just do it? Why do you have to be on video? We're poor wayfaring strangers, Becky. <laughs> this world is not okay. our home. Maranatha, Lord true. Jesus. Yeah. <sighs> oh, so, okay. okay. So when, okay, go ahead. No, you go ahead. You, I was going to say, so me. When, when we humble ourselves, you yeah. say in the next one, when we humble ourselves before God, it allows us to live sacrificially. Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about that for a minute though, because what does, and we talked about it some because we don't want to take it be taken advantage of, but what does it mean to live sacrificially? So that's part of the discussion question. So that's good. How are you a living sacrifice to God? Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't know how to answer that actually when I first wrote it, yeah. because I don't really know what it means, except now that I'm reading it now and we're having this conversation, uh, Philippians 3, 8 in our text, it says more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Mm -hmm. And that might be humility. It's that your whole focus is not on you, but it's on the one who is worth it. So maybe that's a definition of humility. I consider all things lost for the sake of knowing Christ. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's it's the same way of saying, take up your cross and follow me, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. It's a complete or being a slave of Christ. It's the complete abandonment of self into the arms of that ultimate good that, you know, Jesus Mm. Christ is. Maybe that's the way I'd answer that. Wow. I think we'll think about that for a minute. Okay. No, that that's, that's really powerful. That's really powerful. But I've tried in my mind to figure out what would I consider loss? Does, does Paul really mean like my, my marriage? Does Paul really mean my kids? Does Paul mean my job? Does Paul mean, what does he mean? Like I consider this a loss, all the good things. Could it be everything? It would have to be, but I mean, just like think about the consequences of that. That's tough. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think any of us would want to, but when you, I don't know, I think that's probably part of that maturing in your relationship. Yeah, I think you know, so. it's, it's a, it's a process. It's not a place that you're going to come to immediately, but it's a process of understanding because you go on to say that when we humble ourselves before God, we learn to submit to God and submit to one another. Yeah. Super and important when you, concept. When you submit to one another, then maybe your loss isn't as bad as you think it might be. Yeah. If everybody was playing the same game, but it doesn't work that way. No. 
Yeah. Like I've been in marriage counseling yeah. context where I think one person is truly trying to submit and the other person is truly trying to run and run the relationship and run out of the relationship. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> And I, and I hate that. Or it's kind of like, you know, communism is probably not a bad system if everybody would participate, but nobody wants to, you right? You know, that's true. I Capitalism think, uh, would be good if, any, if everybody yeah. would play by the rules. Right. But nobody, but that comes back to that human nature. Then we come mm-hmm. back to being the atom, you know, and, and that following Christ is countercultural yeah. and counter to our nature. Um, you know, if we're all if we're all trying to take the shortcuts <laughs> and right. elevate ourselves with the power and authority, then we're not all submitting to each other. Preach and that, sister. And, and that is human nature. Yeah, that unfortunately tough. is human nature. It's all game. So how theory. do you, dis- how do you describe, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but that's that, that would really be submission and being yeah. submissive. That would really be what that is. I think is giving up is, all things to Christ. Yeah everything so how do we apply this to our lives well thanks daily bread devotional talk this is a great story yeah so booker t washington um funny enough just if you're keeping score at home my nickname when i was a kid was booker t but nonetheless um really yep that's interesting okay it is uh so booker t washington really smart black guy Back in the old South, you know, uh, he was the uh, president of the the, uh, Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Uh, And, you know, a wealthy white woman, you know, just saw somebody that was uh, dark skinned and thought, oh, they'll do something for me. You know, at least in the story, she offered to pay. So at least that was something. But she was presuming something first. That's the product. She was presuming that she, as a person of privilege, could impose on somebody that needed something. Right. right. And, because and, she had moral superiority and authority. Yeah. And money. And money. Yeah. And so she, you know, he, she asked, well, hey, will you um, cut this wood, bring it up? Sure. You know. And then somebody in the neighborhood, little girl, realized, you know, what had just happened. And she was embarrassed, you know, to her credit, at least. She was embarrassed that she, you know, she was embarrassed that she you know, would act that way in front of the president of a university who knows what she would act like if it was just some dude but nonetheless um she decided that she was going to basically do a fundraiser for him and and so that's what it did and so the end of the story is the woman you know goes to apologize and he says it's perfectly all right madam occasionally i enjoy a little manual labor me too very little (laughs) and besides it's always a delight to do something for a friend and so like he just took that as a time and it could be And what I would like to think, I don't know the story, but what I would like to think, because he humbled himself and and didn't have to get even and extended that term friend, she went she went out transformed. And that's exactly what the the cross did. Christ's submission to the cross redeems and transforms the world. And so when we practice humility like that, we contribute to the transformation of the world. I'm Mm -hmm. hoping is what happened. Now, right. who knows? She might have gone out and done the same thing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think so. I think, you know, I think anytime you have a encounter like that, where ah, encounter, yay. Sorry. It was, get, that was awesome. Okay. Um, but that's where we need that little applause button. Somewhere. Right. You know, <laughs> our buzzword of the day. Anytime we say encounter. Yay. <laughs> um. I think anytime that you have something like this happen in your life and you are transformed, it it should, it should. And I hope, and I pray that it does, that it changes you. It, It changes how you see yourself and it changes how you see the world around you. And it changes how you see other people. Yeah. I pray that's what it does. Cause it should. Yeah. So it should. Yeah. And, and so we should respond. I've, I was telling Becky, you know, before we started recording this, like, I, it's happened to me. I guess I just look like I work at like Walmart or Best Buy, but people will come and be like, You're wearing the Best Buy blue shirt yeah, today. Yeah. Where can I find this? I'm like, I don't know, dude. <laughs> I don't work here. Um, but like I've done it to other people and they, it's like they look at me like I slap them on the side of the head. Like, how would you assume that I worked here at Best Buy? Like, I'm one of yeah. these people. I'm like, Because uh, you're wearing a blue shirt. 
<laughs> at Best Buy right. or Walmart. That's why. Right. Yeah. Uh, but just those little attitudes, you know, it pops up. You can tell when you when you got your pride stepped on a little bit, and that's probably some. Yeah, that's a learning experience. What the chiropractor would say are pressure points that you, yeah. you need to work out with fear and trembling. Yeah, yeah. So work it out with fear and trembling. Mm -mm -mm. So we're going to close with this, this question while I'm going to pose this to Sunday school teachers. So this is a great question for your class. How, how would you respond if you were in Booker T. Washington's shoes? How would have you responded to somebody who said, hey, I need this done. Can you just go and take that when you were in that place of status and elevation? So. Yeah. And remember, you have a cell phone today. So what would you had a cell phone with access to Facebook and Twitter and everything else? How would you react? Yeah. Would you be recording it saying, look, look at this Karen over here yeah. thinking right? that she's all, you know? Yeah. That's a great question for your for your class today. So let's close on that. This is this has been a great quarter. And uh, I hope. I hope again that uh, those of you that are watching that have joined us this week, remember to hit the button below, like, and subscribe to this channel and click the little bell to be notified of new content coming out. Really excited that, that we're going to start a new quarter on wisdom literature starting next week. Um, Cause we can all use a little wisdom, but maybe this week, a little humility, a little humility goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Blessings on everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye.